Yeah, so thank you very much for uh, having me. I've been having so many great uh, meetings today and meeting all the great uh, students that you guys have here. So a lot of connections with BYU. We have a lot of former undergrads in our department. One of them is a very prominent professor now, George Hoover. So uh, I heard from George very uh, good stories from around this place. So I'm very excited to be here. So, um, so today I want to talk to you a little about uh, uh, optimization of energy systems. And um, what I want to give you is a little bit of, uh, of, um, of, of a feeling of how energy systems I, I particularly find fascinating because uh, this starts getting into things related to uh, interfaces where data, market data, weather data, all sorts of different types of data, very complicated uh, data sets are coming into place. Then you need to use these data sets to uh, try to figure out how a physical system behaves without building it, right? And for that, you need to model the system and simulate the system. And then also how uh, you can make decisions to, uh, uh, to drive the system in an optimal way to participate in electricity markets and things like that. So I'm going to try to give you a flavor of the things uh, that we're working on. So today I had meetings with uh, a lot of the faculty here, and we pretty much cover a very broad spectrum of technologies that probably you see in this, uh, in this slide. I think what has been fascinating uh, since uh, uh, probably the last 10 years in the energy landscape is that we've been seeing the emergence of a lot of very interesting technologies and just uh, also retrofitting of old technologies, or what we consider old technologies like nuclear and coal, that are being reinvented in uh, creative ways to try to uh, 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 face some of the challenges that we have. So the, the interesting thing with the development of energy systems, right, is that we have a lot of layers here that we're trying, interested in exploring. So there's a lot of people doing materials and uh, cat uh, catalysis type of uh, work uh, that is motivated by different types of uh, technologies or devices like batteries, thermal storage, heat recovery, uh, wind turbines, solar collectors, and things like that. Uh, then we start uh, combining these individual devices to create systems. And these systems are getting increasingly sophisticated. They start taking very complicated forms like hybrid energy systems. And I'll explain why that is the case. One of the reasons for hybrid energy systems is that they can provide more flexibility to participate in multiple electricity markets. And then at the last layer, um, what you have is really the infrastructures that are driving everything. So uh, issues related to environmental issues, uh, supply chains, transportation networks, electricity networks, natural gas networks, and uh, climate and weather uh, related issues. So. So we as chemical engineers, or as engineers in general, I think it's very important to understand the interconnections between all these things. Because the problem is that if we don't pay attention to how the infrastructure is driving new technologies, we can invest our time in the wrong technology. And that has happened a lot. Like the uh, Department of Energy, particularly when I was there, it happened a lot. So, uh, so it's very important to understand the entire landscape and how these things are driving things. So let me motivate a little bit why, uh, um, how some of the infrastructures are motivating some new technologies. So, so this is a map of the electricity uh, markets and renewable portfolio standards. So some of you might be familiar with uh, some, of this, uh, uh, some of this information. So the United States is organized in several organized markets. So uh, this has evolved historically over a number of years, almost organically. Uh, in, so I'm located in Wisconsin, which is part of something that is called the Mid-Continent ISO. This is an organized, non-for-profit non organization uh, that essentially is going to manage all the power and uh, supply and demand in the region. So these are very big networks, right? Uh, the biggest network by volume is PJM, which is on the East Coast. So those uh, guys are supplying a, a very, very large proportion of power. Um, you guys are located in an area that is called in the electricity market jargon, the wild, wild west. <laughs> and, and the reason why they call it the wild, wild west is because there's no organized market. <laughs> and so essentially this is also historic. There are historical reasons behind this, right? Is the geographical locations and complicated uh, terrain that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that you have in some of these uh, areas. Uh, so here in this area, you have utilities that actually are controlling the market, right? Um, so California has its own market system. Okay, so, uh, so uh, this thing is um, organized in different regions. These ISOs are very large organizations. They have to manage and coordinate electricity transactions in the system. And the different areas have different goals in renewable portfolio standards, right? We want to put uh, more renewable power into the system. 
Um, but the question is really um, if, um, if we can achieve all these targets for renewable energy. So, so uh, in a lot of the things that you see in the, in the studies that you see reported in the New York Times and things like that, all those numbers, people get into very uh, nasty debates about if this is actually possible or not. Uh, so uh, we are engineers, right? So we uh, like to dig into the details about if these technologies can actually make sense or not. So let's understand a little bit uh, what are some of the challenges that arise here. So this is something that is called a uh, net load from the California ISO. So this is data that the California ISO put together. And one of the things that the California ISO are concerned about is that they're installing all these photovoltaic panels, right? And the net load is essentially the current load that they have and you subtract all the power that you're gonna be in introducing by uh, this uh, photovoltaic power. Now, sun, the sun and solar radiation is very predictable when it comes out and when it comes back, right? So when the sun sets and sun rises. So this gives you this concept of the inverted uh, uh, duck curve, which uh, uh, people in the electricity markets like to talk a lot about. One of the big issues with this duck curve is that there are times of the day, particularly during peak time when the sun is like very strong, right? When the solar radiation is strong, where the net load is gonna be a minimum. But the big issue for these guys is really not this. The big issue for them is when the sun is setting, you need this very large amount of ramping capacity. So you need power plants to be able to, within three hours, be able to move uh, to very high capacity to offset uh, the fact that you're not gonna have the sun around. So they're very concerned about this because this is a very large amount of ramping capacity. Now, uh, you might be familiar with this. Power plants are not the fastest devices in the world. They're very large monolithic uh, units. So, so units like uh, coal plants, they can be uh, ramped very, very slowly. It's a very, very slow ramp uh, in the uh, hours time scales. Uh, natural gas power plants are actually, there's a reason why we're deploying more and more of them because they have very large ramping capacity so they can provide some of this potential. But the California is so, they, they think that this, uh, this is gonna be a, a challenge. It's still not clear if we're gonna be able to meet these ramps if we start installing more and more photovoltaic panels in the system. Now, the, the other case that I find a little more interesting is uh, the issue related to wind power. So the problem with wind power is that it's, it is, uh, has very strong dynamics. It's highly volatile. And, and what I'm gonna show you is that uh, wind power actually has two issues. One of them is that um, the wind turbines are big devices that cannot be slowed down at will. So if, if uh, we normally tend to think that the big issue with wind turbines is that the wind is gonna stop blowing, but the, there's also issues when the wind is blowing and we actually have excess electricity in the grid, and then you need to slow down the wind turbine so that we don't, because the, the power grid is actually not capable of absorbing wind anymore. So that is a concept that is called uh, stranded power. And this is a power that comes because you cannot slow down the wind turbines at will. And I'm actually gonna show you uh, that if you try to do that, then you introduce a very big mechanical stress in the wind turbine to a point that you can actually break them. So, so this is a big deal. So this is data from the Midwest ISO uh, in the Midwest of the United States. So MISO reported in 2014, uh, this was three years ago when we didn't even have that much power and wind power installed that they had enough 17 terawatt hours of stranded power in the entire year, so that's enough to power one million homes. So this is power that they have to ground or they have to sell at negative prices. And if you sell, uh, I'm gonna show you what happens with when you have negative prices, but if you start selling wind power at negative prices, this is not a good business for the wind turbines, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, so people start abandoning investment and then you have all sorts of other complications. So this is a big deal, stranded power. But the other technical issue is the actual the variability. And the issue with the variability is that wind power has several harmonic contents. So if you, for <coughs> people that are taking control, right? So if you do a Fourier uh, transform of the wind power spectrum, right? You, you wanna get the spectrum. What you're gonna find is that wind power has a very uh, dominating spectrum around this uh, uh, region. But you have this uh, non-negligible amount of power that is actually varying at a certain frequency that is on the order of minutes to minute variations. This is the one that really hurts the power grid because there are really very few technologies that can actually absorb this, this level of, uh, of frequency. So you can absorb the very fast frequencies, you can absorb the very slow frequencies, 
but the ones that are here really like put the stress in the system. There are not that many technologies that can help the, uh, the power grid and the ISO to take care of those minute-to-minute uh, -minute variations. So and I'll explain in a second why that is the case. But this is an issue with wind power, that you're introducing this new spectrum of variations that the power grid cannot absorb, and, or they have limits into how much they can actually absorb. So this is one of the things that people are also uh, worried a little bit about. All right. So for people that are taking process control, are you teaching process control, John? I am. All right. So hopefully you will appreciate what John is teaching you. Mm -hmm. um, this is the reason why the power grid doesn't fail. Uh, so if you think about it, uh, the blackouts in the, in the United States are very rare, very, very rare. And one of the reasons for that is that the ISOs actually have a very sophisticated control architecture. So they have uh, very sophisticated levels of a hierarchy, and this hierarchy is designed in such a way that at any moment, any second, any millisecond, supply and demand have to be matched. And if you don't match supply and demand at any moment, then you start having excursions in frequency. Right, so and then your, your equipment is going to start frying and things like that. So, so in the US, we keep uh, equipment at 60 hertz, right? So we don't want to deviate uh, from those 60 hertz. So what this thing is, is a very sophisticated control architecture that actually is tightly integrated to the markets, all right? So the, here, the key idea is that you're going to have suppliers and, and consumers bidding into the market for energy. And, and each one of these layers, the ISO is going to decide which one of these suppliers and consumers they're going to be using in the network uh, to be able to uh, match, uh, match the uh, supply and demand in, in ev every location in the network. Now, they do this at multiple time scales. So they have um, markets that operate with a one hour resolution. We, they, they foresee the, the load or the, the demand that they're going to see for the next 24 hours. And they're scheduling these generators every hour. Then they can also uh, schedule generation every 15 minutes. They can uh, schedule generation every five minutes. And the one that does the dirty job is something that is called automatic generation control. This is the guy that has to regulate uh, the frequency of the power grid. This one runs every five seconds. So you see that there are multiple time scales, and they're always trying to coordinate uh, supply and demand at all these different time scales in order to uh, mitigate the demand. The very interesting thing is that if I go back to here, the guy that has to absorb this is this guy, the automatic generation control. This is the one that has to take care of that uh, uh, frequencies that, that we have in the, in the system. So as a result of this, what I'm going to show you is that the market for this thing, for this product, is actually increasing significantly. And this is generating new incentives for new technologies, like batteries and other type of storage uh, devices that are very important. What I'm also going to show you is that these two layers, um, in using current market data, I'm going to show you that 90% of the revenue is actually located in these two regions. So if you're a, 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 a power plant that is trying to provide power to the power grid, you really want to sell power at these uh, locations. Why? Because think about it this way. How many technologies we actually know that can ramp up and down so fast? Right? There are not that many. So, so they, those, those uh, technologies are actually very valuable, right? OK, so that uh, uh, hierarchy um, actually is operated as multiple markets. And this is something that I found kind of uh, like uh, it was uh, eye-opening for me when I started looking into this uh, thing. I didn't realize this. So you can sell electricity to the power grid at different um, uh, time intervals and different time scales. So you can sell electricity to the power grid in the day ahead market with one hour resolution. You can sell electricity uh, to the 50 minute market. We are looking one, one hour ahead or, day, uh, or a day ahead. You can also sell electricity to a power grid with a five minute resolution. And you can be selling this electricity at any moment that you, that you guys want, but uh, you can, you can, your electricity is valuable. At, uh, it has a different value at these different time scales. So there are different market products. Now you can also sell electricity to the power grid in the form not of energy, but of ancillary services. So for example, the typical products for ancillary services are spinning reserves. So how that works is that if you're a power plant, you can say, you know what? I, I'm not going to sell you electricity, but I'm going to sell you the opportunity to use my electricity in case that you need it. The good thing about these products is that they actually don't burn that much fuel, right? So you can just have the power plant idle, and it has to be sufficiently warm to be able to ramp up. 
but, uh, but, but they don't produce it in electricity. So this is just an insurance, almost like an insurance thing, right? Um, the product that we're interested in is uh, the power regulation. So this is the frequency regulation that I was telling you about. So this is the one that runs between two seconds and 15 seconds. This is a product that you can also sell. The way this uh, product works is uh, you as a battery can tell the power grid, I'm gonna sell you this, this much amount of uh, band of capacity that I have, and you have the opportunity to ramp up and down my capacity at any moment that you want. And I'll give you full flexibility to do that. So that's just a very interesting product that also uh, is becoming important here. Do you have any questions on this? Feel free to interrupt at any moment. All good? All right. So whenever you see a lot of math, just close your eyes. Uh, <laughs> so I, I do this just to give you some eye candy, but then I realize that not, not everyone finds this to be as eye candy as I do. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, um, so, so this is how uh, electricity prices are derived. So the interesting history about electricity markets is that uh, up to the early 2000s, we didn't have a very sophisticated system for deriving prices. And you might think how difficult it is to derive prices. Well, it turns out that it's a very difficult problem. Uh, starting in, in the year 2000, there's an optimization person at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. His name is Dick O'Neill, that is the chief economic officer with a background in optimization. And he said, you know what, guys, I think we need to be using optimization to derive these prices. What is interesting about this person is that he's a chemical engineer, right? So, so he was trained in a lot of the techniques that, that we actually like in chemical engineering. But he's managing the power grid, so I go figure. So, um, but anyway, so this is just to give you a, an idea of how electricity prices are derived. So what happens is that uh, the ISO will be overlooking a certain network. So here I'm just showing you uh, Illinois, but any arbitrary network. They're going to get bids for demands. So these are the prices for demands. And these are the prices for supply. And this set of suppliers and of demands can be thousands. Yeah, you have a lot, a lot of power plants and a lot of consumers that are trying to get power from the system. They're going to have some basic model of the dynamics of the system that tells them how quickly different technologies can ramp up and down. And they're going to have Kirchhoff's loss, right? And this is just the balance of power in the, in the system. And this balance of power occurs at every node in the network. So you have 1,000 nodes, you're going to have 1,000 power balances in the network. And then you're going to have all sorts of constraints that constrain how much capacity of generation you have, how quickly you can ramp up and down. And the demands are also going to be bounded. Then you're going to have voltages that have to be bounded as well and things like that. All right. So they solve this big optimization problem. And this problem, what it does is maximizes the social welfare. So the social welfare is essentially, I want to provide as much demand as possible to the people that are asking for it, right? But at the same time, I want to minimize cost. So that's why you see I maximize demand and I minimize, by putting this minus sign here, the cost of generation. So this system will automatically tell the operators which generators they're going to be using at different moments in time to provide the electricity at the cheapest, uh, at the cheapest, uh, in the cheapest way possible. Now, there's a quantity that is hidden here that is called a shadow price because precisely it's a hidden quantity, which is something that in optimization we call a Lagrange multiplier. The Lagrange multiplier, what it tells you is, if I inject an infinitesimal amount of power in this node, how much is the social welfare going to increase or decrease? So it gives you the sensitivity of the social welfare to any injection in the system. Right? So this is how the prices are derived. So essentially, the prices are derived by looking at this Lagrange multiplier in the system. The interesting thing, the United States in Europe is not like this. Uh, the Lagrange, this the Lagrange, the prices, the, the prices are actually vary per node. So we have these very exotic fields of prices that actually, well, I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, but we have these very exotic fields of prices. In Europe, they only have one price per country. And, and economists have for the longest time argued if that has benefits or not. And uh, I'm a strong believer that you need to price it this way for reasons that I'm going to tell you later. Uh, but essentially, uh, so yeah, so we have a price per every location and also at different points in time. Okay? So how the prices look like? So you can actually download this data from the California ISO. This is all public information. 
These are non-profit organizations, so they are need to release all this information to the market participants. So these are the day ahead prices. So this is electricity that is traded with one hour resolution. So these are very slow transactions. So think about only the slow power plants are actually participating in this market. So you see that on average, the price in California is around $20 per megawatt. And you see that during summer, the price spikes to $100 per megawatt. So a factor of five, which is not terrible, right? And then you see that from time to time, the prices almost collapse to zero. So what that means is that you, you are start getting very, very close to have excess supply compared to demand. So you have too much power in the system. And at some points, they can become negative, but they don't become too negative. So when they become negative, it's precisely because they have excess capacity, uh, excess supply in the system, and they cannot, they need to do something with it. So they need to pay people to use it. Now, if you look at the real-time markets, this looks very different. Like the five-minute resolution market is a very, very highly, uh, a highly, highly volatile market. So what you see is that the prices, actually, on average, they are very similar. But you see a very high frequency. It's very, very likely that the prices are reaching up to $1,000 per megawatt. So this is a factor of, uh, what is it, 50, right? So, so you see a lot of variability in this market, and you see very, very often that the prices are actually going negative, and sometimes they go to minus $500. Now, if you are a battery owner, you want to be here, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to absorb this electricity. So they told me funny stories when I was at Argonne. So apparently in the 80s, negative prices were around already. People will actually plug uh, bands full of toasters to a substation. So that whenever they will see negative prices, they will use electricity and actually get the, the payback. So, <laughs> so if you don't do it, but apparently people have done it. So they stole my idea. So anyway, so uh, uh, so anyway, so so what I want to show you is that uh, so there's a lot of data for analyzing some of these markets, uh, but it's very very challenging to actually try to make a decision about. Uh, uh, if you're a technology provider trying to understand, for example, where should I place my power plant based on the prices that I have? If I have a lot of batteries, where do I place it, right? So, um, so the reason is that the prices are very volatile in time and in space, right? So this is a map of California with all the prices for the day ahead market, I, no, for the real time market, I believe. And this is at uh, on a Tuesday, December 8, 2015, no particular, nothing happened on that day. I just pick it randomly. This is a 5.45, and this is a 5.55. So you see here that the price here on average is around $40 per megawatt. Here, all of a sudden, the state becomes red. So this is not an election or anything like that. This is actually the, the market. <laughs> and then the, the, the prices reach $100 per megawatt in a lot of locations. And then just 10 minutes later, the prices collapse again, right? Uh, so there's some interesting dynamics here. Uh, but this is a very challenging type of data set to analyze. So you download all the data from the California ISO. So you are downloading around one terabyte of data for just one year, right? And don't do this in your laptop. Like, I tried it, and then I had to buy a new laptop. So, so there are 700 and billion data points uh, in, 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 in this data set. So this is very, very in, uh, data intensive uh, process. So, so now that you have this data, so imagine you have all this data and you can download it. Uh, so the questions that you can ask with this data is, OK, if I have a system with certain flexibility limits, can, what is the best market to participate in? How my flexibility can uh, make the most out of this market? Uh, but at the same time, it's also some of these markets are very volatile, so how do I deal with the uncertainty of some of these markets? So some of them are better behaved than others. Some of them behave almost like the stock market. Right? It's like very, very hard to predict. Uh, and also, how do you deal with this complexity where you have a lot of uh, uh, very sophisticated type of uh, uh, technologies and, and, and data sets that, that you have to deal with it? So again, close your eyes. So there's too much, too much math. But, uh, um, so this is where optimization uh, can help you. So uh, the way I think about optimization, I think about op optimization not as, the, as a technology that can help you optimize, surprisingly enough. I think about optimization as, as a tool for discovery. So we want to discover what are the flexibility limits, what is the economic potential of technologies, 
an optimization implicitly is telling you what is the limit of economic potential and the limit of <coughs> flexibility that you have in the system. So it's really more about analyzing that, that flexibility, not necessarily of making things better. That's some part of it, but not, not the whole story. All right, so let me move faster because I only have 10 more minutes. So, um, so there are different optimization paradigms that are very important in the power grid and in the energy systems in general. One of them is something that people call decision making under uncertainty or stochastic program. So a stochastic program is a technique where the key idea is that if you have a scenario, so what could happen in the future? How can I make a decision right now that can actually anticipate that uncertainty and that will put me in a good position to, uh, to make a good decision in the future? So think about that you're driving your car, and I think John, you gave the same example in your seminar, so you might, I might be stealing it. So, uh, so think about you're driving your car and you approach an intersection, right? And you have to make a decision right now. But you don't know how the traffic might look like in different locations, right? So, uh, so you need to make this decision by taking into account possible the scenarios that can happen in the future. So what is the best way to go if I can consider all these scenarios? Uh, you can do this on average, or you can go for the worst case. Depending on what attitude towards risk you take, you can be um, uh, more risk averse, so you can be more risk taking, so I'm more risk averse, so I'm very defensive. Uh, but, but there are different types of uh, formulations that you have available. The other thing that stochastic programming allows you to do is also to measure what is the probability of certain events happening and what will be the impact of those events happening. So imagine if you're the ISO, you really want to understand if there's going to be a wind ramp or something, if, uh, what is the best way of dispatching the power grid so that it can mitigate some of these weather events. So this is one paradigm that, that is very in, uh, important right now in the, in the power grid. The other thing that is becoming very interesting in uh, power grid is that a lot of these phenomena that we have in the power grid is actually multi-scale, if you think about it. So just to give an idea, this is the frequency spectrum of all the power that I was telling you, right? So what is happening is that you need to be making decisions that are actually happening over a long time scale, but at the same time you have to take into account the frequency, the very high frequencies of things that are happening right now. If you are not careful, you can get in a bad situation. For example, uh, do you guys know what this picture is? What, what uh, weather event was that? Do you guys? That was the polar vortex. Yeah, so that was the polar vortex of 2014. At the time I was living in Chicago, and trust me, it was not a fun, <laughs> it was not a fun experience. So, uh, so, um, so the polar vortex was very interesting because it really tested the limits of the natural gas network. So at some point, the, 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 the operators of the natural gas, they were very afraid that they were going to hit this lower bound of how much uh, gas they have reserved because they didn't know, as, as it was happening, they didn't know how long it was going to last, right? So, uh, so this is the type of decision that you really have to think about like one year in advance because if you don't store enough gas uh, during, the, during the year, right, for the winter, then you're going to be in a very bad position in the short term once you have to operate the power plant over here. So there are all different types of aspects in multi-scale uh, optimization and different types of techniques that people are starting to think about. Um, so I'll close your eyes. So uh, a lot of the things that we do in my group is actually uh, trying to identify the structures in some of these optimization problems and try to accelerate the solutions of these problems. So these problems can quickly reach millions of variables. So the, the electric this is actually a real system. The, the electricity uh, dispatch system of the, of the California ISO, for example, this is a giant linear optimization problem that has over 10 million variables. And they solve it with uh, state-of-the-art techniques, very sophisticated type of solver. So these things can actually be solved. The field has evolved significantly. But there are a lot of challenges still, and this is some of the things that, that we work on. So how do we accelerate the solutions of these things? And think about how the ISO has to produce the prices for you every five minutes, and they have to solve a two million variable problem every five minutes, right? So nowadays, those tools can actually do it. And, and this is the point where, where we're actually at. Um, another thing that we do in our group that has helped us a lot in evaluating a lot of these technologies is actually in modeling languages. And you might expect, well, modeling languages, why is the big deal with this, right? We have Aspen, so well, what's better than Aspen? So, um, <laughs> so a lot of things are better than Aspen. <laughs> so uh, so uh, anyway, so, so if you think about it, I, I always like to tell the story of MATLAB and why the reason why MATLAB was invented, because a lot of the young people probably are not aware of this, but uh, 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 but the reason why MATLAB was invented was uh, this was a mathematician called Clay Muller, 
uh, University of New Mexico. And he was teaching his undergraduates how do you solve systems or linear equations, linear systems. And what he realized is that the students were investing 70% of the time implementing the matrices in Fortran and 30% of the time actually thinking about what the algorithm was doing and what the insights were about these uh, linear systems that they were solving. So he got tired of that and he said, I'm going to invent a modeling language that allow my students to implement the matrices. And now think about it in MATLAB, right? You can just put a matrix 20 by 20, a straightforward and solve it, right? So right now the optimization community is also pushing in the direction of trying to do the same for optimization languages. So there's a lot of efforts. Uh, people at Sandia National Labs, uh, people at MIT are also working on this new language uh, called Jump, or based on Julia. Uh, so the key idea with these uh, languages that we are trying to work on is that, we, similar story with MATLAB, we want that any average engineering student can actually implement an optimization problem quickly and can solve it, right? And without having much expertise about mathematics and, and, and optimization. And the other thing is that uh, the new computers are actually parallel, right? But very few undergraduate students actually know how to code in parallel machines. So you don't even want them, want them to know what's happening behind the scenes because they will, they're going to get discouraged uh, very quickly, uh, <laughs> unless they really like it. But, uh, but, but precisely what we're also doing with this is actually create modeling languages that protect the, the student, the user, from knowing that they're using a parallel computing machine. So they only get to see the speed, but they don't get to see what the engine is, right? Um, all right, so I only have five minutes. For, so that was just the motivation. So uh, um, <laughs> let me give you a couple of case studies very quickly of how we're using optimization for analyzing some of these systems. Um, so General Electric, uh, they are very interested in building these very big uh, wind turbines, right? And if you see this thing, um, so you see that the size of the wind turbines that we've been uh, building uh, is actually uh, a, a nonlinear function. And the reason for that is that this actually has economies of scale in there, right? So we're still at a point where making bigger turbines can extract more power in a nonlinear way. So the bigger the wind turbine, the higher they are, the, the actual more power that they can extract. So we haven't reached the upper bound in the economies of scale here. So they're projecting right now, so we're over here. The biggest, uh, largest turbine in the, in the world is around 178 meters. So these ones are for offshore applications. So these ones are going to reach 252 meters. Just to give you an idea of how large these things are, right? So I always like this type of comparisons. But uh, So this uh, wind turbine of 135 meters, this was the largest turbine in the world in Germany a couple of uh, years ago, I think. Um, and this is the, the, the size of the Washington Monument, just to get an idea of uh, how big this is. Uh, what I find the most impressive thing is not necessarily the height, but also the span of the, of the blades. So if you can actually put an airplane, a uh, Boeing 747, and the span of the blades are is, is essentially the matching the size of the airplane. So what does this mean? These things are big, these things are heavy, and they have a lot of mechanical stress and momentum. So the same type of mechanical stress that you are experiencing in an airplane, right, when you're landing. So, so uh, these things get exposed to very, very similar type of uh, uh, mechanical stress. So what General Electric was interested in, again, uh, sorry for the math, is uh, they're interested in modeling these wind turbines. And they apparently there's an industrial standard that forces General Electric to show that if they're going to deploy a new control strategy in, in some of these wind turbines, they need to guarantee that this uh, turbine is never going to experience a certain mechanical load that, that they call the, the critical load, because that will blow up and then you have it flying on the highway and things like that, right? So, uh, so the way that they approach the problem, they develop models. Those are dynamical models. And they also model uh, different types of control loss that they're going to embed in the wind turbines. So these control loss, they have two functions. They want to control the torque. So in mind, when the wind speed is hitting you, you can actually slow down, right? You can slow down the, uh, the motor. And then if you slow down this, uh, you're going to generate more uh, torque. And uh, torque is proportional to power, so you're going to extract more power. At the same time, you can also control the pitch. So the pitch is, think about you have the wind blade, and you're just rotating in this direction. <coughs> now, these are things that we don't see from the highway, because these things are so big and so monolithic, right? But, but, uh, but, but these things are moving, and they're doing it in real time, right? Now, the interesting thing with these two controllers is that when you generate more torque, 
you generate more power, but also you generate more mechanical stress. And this is where, takes me back to the original thing that I was telling you, these things cannot be slowed down at will. These are very big machines. So you try to slow it down, for example, in an event of a storm, it actually takes them half an hour to try to bring them offline. So you have to do it very, very slowly. You cannot just do it like now, right? Uh, so there's a lot of momentum in these uh, big, uh, uh, big monsters, right? So the critical trade-off here is for General Electric is that they want to tune the controllers in a way that they extract maximum power, but they also want to control this mechanical load. They don't want to pass this threshold that the, that, the, that the industrial standard is asking them. So the way that they approach the problem, they formulate, uh, or what we have helped them do, is to formulate the controller tuning problem. You don't have to, I'm not going to go through this, right? But, but you formulate this problem precisely as an, a stochastic programming problem, the thing that I was telling you, decision-making on the uncertainty type of problem, where the key idea is to find those control parameters in a way that they can withstand any possible scenario of wind speed that they have available. And they're talking about thousands of wind speed situations. So think about like all the conditions that you need to test uh, some of these systems on the right. So there are thousands and thousands of scenarios, and you need to do this quickly. And this is a very intensive optimization problem, right? Uh, but essentially, the idea with the optimization problem is find me the control parameters the maximize power, but at the same time never, pa never pass a certain threshold for load with a certain level of probability. So what we found out in some of these numbers is that <coughs> the nominal control parameters that they had available uh, for a wind turbine of 5 megawatts, uh, this wind turbine is able to extract 23 gigawatts hours per year. If you uh, sell this electricity at $30 per megawatt, this is uh, $693,000 per year. This is for a single wind turbine, right? So now think about a wind farm. So these are big numbers. Um, the optimal combination of tuning parameters uh, can actually extract 20, uh, 27 gigawatt hours per year, and you can uh, extract $800,000 per year. So this is how much better they can be. I'm oh, sorry, I'll wait till yep. sorry. Go ahead. Yep. It's better because it slows me down. So. How much does a normal wind turbine that can produce this cost? What do you mean by that? Like capital. Oh, yeah. capital investment. Uh, for a five megawatt, I don't know. Let me think about it. I have to extrapolate based on the numbers that I know. So yeah, let me, let me I'll go back to, to you on this. Um, so yeah, so you're trying to get into the return of investment, right? So. Yeah, so the, so the amount of power that you can improve just by better tuning these control parameters, so this actually control settings are actually very valuable for them, is around 17%. And, and this is uh, just a snapshot in one of the scenarios that we have, just to give an idea how the power is able to be able to be increased. And what is interesting is that you can also, uh, um, you can also um, push the system to a larger mechanical load because you have the guarantee that you're never going to pass that threshold that you have. So unfortunately, when you don't capture all these scenarios, you don't have that guarantee. So this is an optimization problem that involves 7.5 million variables. So this is a very big optimization problem. To the best of my knowledge, this is the largest nonlinear optimization problem uh, reported in the literature. Um, so this problem nowadays, with the tools that I was showing you, and this was actually solved by a graduate student, right, with using Julia and optimization tools, this solves in one hour. And this is in a computing server with 30 cores, right? So it's not a very sophisticated computing server. Um, so these are uh, very big problems, but they can be solved nowadays with the tools uh, that we have available. And I think I'm gonna stop here, but I'm always tempted to go. I can stop now. So, and that will be the healthy spot to. Probably the only thing I'm gonna tell in the last minute is, uh, we're analyzing other types of technologies like concentrated solar power uh, where we're trying to decide where to sell electricity to, to the different markets. We're also looking into batteries and how you can use batteries to provide uh, uh, um, flexibility to buildings in campuses. So Johnson Controls is interested in this problem. And at the same time, provide a frequency regulation capacity that we have available. So there's a lot of opportunities for doing optimization energy systems. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to give you more information. So thank you. Yeah.
was actually kind of interesting because I think it opens up a new degree of freedom for the optimization where you actually encourage a consumer yep. to participate in this and when there's high electricity prices, maybe their appliances automatically turn yep. off or a freezer will subcool Correct. through the night and then maybe yep. build up that energy or something like that. What what things have you seen that are happening now because of those new sensors? So definitely so Alcoa so uh, the aluminum company, right? So, so they actually, these guys have been doing for the last five years, I believe, they've been doing load management to keep track of those electricity prices. And they do it in real time. And uh, so they are using those, uh, those uh, opportunities for doing that. Now, this was the whole premise that smart meters were gonna help the average guys like us to exploit these electricity prices. But what is interesting about this electricity price is that these are wholesale electricity prices. These are not the electricity prices that we see in our homes. In our homes, we see the utility prices, the retail prices. And the problem with the utilities is that they get on the way of the, of the electricity market. So we actually don't see those things. So you need to be connected to a substation directly to be able to, to do this thing. Uh, but definitely, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities to actually make use of this electricity at negative prices. And I think the opportunities are there. I mean, the prices are there. So you, you should just go ahead and use it. So, yep. So in the most optimal system, the individual system based on individual consumers instead of utilities and these large ISOs? Well, this is a good question. So the problem is when you don't have the ISOs, and there was a phase in the United States when we didn't have ISOs, then you get into very bad situations like the California energy crisis. Right when the Enron was doing funny stuff, so uh, so so the problem is uh, this actually triggered a lot of uh, uh, of uh, the new developments in the ISO and doing the more efficient markets and monitoring the markets. So um, so yeah, these markets are imperfect because these markets are. What is different about these markets than stock markets is that these are actually physical markets. You are actually trading a physical commodity and you have physical constraints. Not like in the stock market that you're just like making up a value for something, right? <laughs> so, uh, so the uh, so so yeah. In look, the, let me answer the question this way. What the economists are trying to do is they are trying to design the market in a way that it gets as close as possible to that fully decentralized market. The ISO actually is not allowed to interfere with the market. They cannot fudge the prices arbitrarily. And if they're going to do it, they have to uh, explain why that is the case. Uh, so the, the market is designed in a way that it behaves almost like a free market within the, the physical constraints that you have. Um, so it al it's already very up there, but there are still imperfections to it. So based on that, is the, is the, are the ISOs, those areas that have ISOs, are they more optimal than the areas that don't? Oh, now that's a question of what, how do you define as optimal? <laughs> uh, if you define as optimal, the, the way I define optimal is the opportunity to jump in into the market. So if you are an electricity provider, if you are a, think about that you invent a new technology for providing power. If the electricity market is not well defined, you're not gonna find the incentive to install it in there. So there's no incentive for innovation. So the market is not capable of absorbing new technologies. So I think as a measure of optimality, that flexibility for the markets to be able to absorb new technologies quickly so that those signals are actually a true reflection of the needs that the system have, right? So that's why I think that the organized markets are better in that respect. Now, some people don't like the volatility. They would rather have a higher average price with no volatility than uh, a, a, a price that is very, very volatile, right? And this is the premise also why in Europe they do it a little differently. They, they don't like volatility as much. Yep. Yep. That's a yeah, I think that's a great question. So this is based, uh, a lot of the studies that they make on wind turbines, they are based on a standardized size wind turbine. And this one is for that standardized size wind turbine. That is a great question. 
Um, I will expect that, yeah, the proportion of the, the shape probably is not going to change much, but probably the, the proportion that you see on the different uh, spectrum will, will change. But that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. That's a very good question. I don't know. I can run a simulation and, and try to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good paper, so you want to be a co author. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll uh, acknowledge you. So. doing a stochastic problem, there's always going to be some random event that exceeds maybe what you anticipated. So yes. you just assume the percentage is so, the, the probability is so low that, that, that you'll have that catastrophic thing that you yeah. just don't worry about it? Yeah. So, yeah, so that's a very good question. And this is a fundamental problem with any statistical-based type of optimization technique that we need to make assumptions on, on, on the shape of this distribution and what is the probability density function that is explaining those rare events. So, so some of the, the tails of the distribution go to infinity. Yeah. You know, can make yeah. a big difference. Yeah, exactly. So there are techniques that they, what they try to do is to create a scenarios that are more heavily biased towards their very rare events. But there's always a very slow chance that a higher event will be. So there are techniques also that protect you against the worst, worst case. But as you might expect, if you prepare yourself against the worst, worst case, you become super defensive and it becomes very expensive, right? So there are interesting trade-offs that people are working on, on, on how do you trade off that level of conservativeness against the, the economic cost? What probability were we willing to let go? That, that's, that's the question. Because there's always going to be a little probability that some worst event will show up, right? Like the polar vortex or a black swan or something like that. Right? So, yeah. It, it was just a fundamental problem, I would say. Yeah. Okay, let's